In Bolivia, political parties are on the last day of campaigning for the regional elections to be held this Sunday. Foreign ministers of the Association of Southeast Asian States urged the parties in Myanmar to seek a peaceful solution to the conflict. This Wednesday, Rwanda received the first batch of 240,000 doses of the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine from the COVAX mechanism. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm Gladys Quesada. In Bolivia, political parties are on the last day of campaigning for the regional elections to be held this Sunday. Candidates and political groups in several regions of the country are carrying out their last activities with rallies and marches as part of the closing of the electoral campaigning period. Around 25,000 members of the national police will be mobilized to guarantee the security of the electoral activities. At the same time, they will try to ensure the respect for the Electoral Silence Day that begins on Thursday at dawn. In this context, several regional candidates announced the suspension of their events as a compassion gesture with the families of the students killed in the tragedy at a university in El Alto. A court in Chile revoked the preventative prison order of former Chilean police officer, also known as Carabineros, Sebastián Zamora, accused of the attempted homicide of a teenager poached from the Pionono Bridge in the capital Santiago last year. The court cancelled the preventive measure which had Zamora serving for five months. It has rights the former policeman to remain under full house arrest for the rest of the investigation. On October 3, 2020, Zamora pushed a teenager over a bridge to the Mapocho River during a protest related to Chile's current social unrest. The eight-meter fall did not kill the young man, but it left him with several fractures in his body, which required surgery. The case exposed the rampant brutality within security forces and sparked anger demonstrations among the Chilean people. Former Peruvian President Alberto Fujimori is on trial for his role in a 1990s government program in which many indigenous women in poor communities were forcibly sterilized, with some dying of suffering of serious injuries because of the infection. The judicial process led by Judge Rafael Martinez began on Monday, following years of demands by human rights activists, as well as numerous obstacles, including prosecutors which solved investigations of Fujimori in the past. The new prosecutor in the case, published Espinosa said sterilizations were carried out in unsanitary conditions and that some women died from infections. Fukimori has been implicated in the deaths of five women and the injuries of another 1,301 women who were allegedly sterilized against their will. Fukimori had boasted that the sterilization program dubbed Peru's birth rate from 3.7 children per woman in 1990 to 2.7 children a decade later. Hundreds of waste pickers took to the streets to the Colombian capital, Bogota, to raise awareness about their contributions to recycling efforts and the promotion of environmental sustainability. Our correspondent, Hernán Tobar, brings us the details. Bogota witnessed the commemoration of Waste Pickers Day as work that is recognized by society, but that every year brings to mind those who have died fulfilling this task and working to protect the environment. On March 1, 1992, it was discovered that at the Barranquilla campus of the Free University's medical school, waste pickers were being murdered by tricking them into the university to collect paper and cardboard, where they were slaughtered, their organs were extracted, and then used for organ trafficking, and their bodies sold for medical studies for $10. The current circumstances in which waste pickers work in the country has resulted in a fall in their income. The prices set for each recycled item are low and many collectors work for more than eight hours a day. They do not have access to a pension or social security. Meanwhile, major corporations are monopolizing this sector and trying to push local waste pickers out of the chain of production, as Doña Cecilia, who has been doing this work since she was 17. The government wants us out. Uribe's children wants us out. They have plenty of wealth and they are the ones who want to buy up the cardboard factories and close them and get rid of us because to them we are garbage. We are worthless to the Uribes. 
they have more money than they know what to do with, which they are making off the backs of us, poor people, who recycle the waste. In Colombia, 500,000 people live of waste collection and recycling and are affected by policies that seek to drive small cooperatives and their workers out of competition. For this reason, they gather to voice their demands in Bolivar Square, where they work and its importance for the protection of the environment were recognized. Today, most of the things we use are made with renewable and non-renewable natural resources. For example, the real material used to make paper. We need to cut down more than 20 years old tree in order to have the port, to use more than 600,000 liters of water, consume more than 7,000 kilowatts of energy per hour. When we undertake this activity, we are reducing the current environmental impact by up to 50%. We recyclers are taking advantage and recovering more than 50% of the total garbage that is being produced. Sector workers stress that they will continue in their struggle until all their labor rights are respected and their well-being guaranteed. They note that their work helps make the planet more sustainable and demand to be heard and not looked down on. Hernan Darío Tobar, Telesur, Bogotá, Colombia. We'll take a short break now. Follow us in Twitter at Telesur English and Gladys Telesur. Welcome back to From the South. Foreign ministers of the Association of Southeast Asian States held talks on Tuesday, expressing their concern over the violence in Myanmar and urging the parties to seek a solution to the conflict. The Secretary General of the Bloc, Lim Jok Hoi, assured that he is willing to help the country in a positive, peaceful and reconstructive manner. The association, which brings together 10 countries, including Myanmar, has a principle of non-interference in each other's affairs. However, member states invited the military government and popular movements to resolve their differences in a peaceful manner. The statements came after official reports cited that clashes during protests on February 28th resulted in 18 fatalities and more than 30 wounds. The World Food Programme and the UN Refugee Agency appealed for 266 million US dollars on Tuesday to end food ration cuts for over 3 million refugees in East Africa. In recent months, the World Food Programme has been forced to implement ration cuts of up to 60 percent, compromising long-standing efforts to achieve food security in refugee camps in Uganda, Kenya, South Sudan, Djibouti and Ethiopia. East Africa hosts one of the largest displaced populations of any region in the world. The impact of the funding shortfalls on refugee families has been compounded by COVID-19 lockdowns and measures to contain the pandemic spread, which had already reduced the availability of food in markets in refugee camps and wrecked many refugees' hopes of helping to support their families through casual labor and small businesses. The Islamic State group claimed responsibility for the killing of three women working for a local radio and TV station in eastern Afghanistan, the latest in a spike in target killings across the country. Thousands of people gathered on Wednesday for the funerals of the three media workers. The women were gunned down on Tuesday in separate attacks. Afghan officials said police arrested the alleged killer of the three, identified him as Quarry Basser and insisted he was a Taliban. Taliban spokesperson Sabihullah Muhadid denied the accusations. Militants said the three female journalists were targeted because they work of one of the media stations loyal to the apostate Afghan government in Jalalabad. It was not the first attack against women working at the Enikas radio and TV. In December, IS claimed the killing of another female employee there, Malala Maiwand. Also, this Wednesday, at least 10 Katyusha rockets hit the Ain al-Assad base in western Iraq, which hosts troops of the U.S.-led International Military Coalition. It was not immediately known if there were any casualties. The Iraqi military said security forces had found the launch pad used for the missiles in the al-Bahari area of Ambar. This is the second time in less than a month that an Ain al-Assad base has been attacked, and it was because of the first attack that the U.S. President Joe Biden ordered against Syrian territory.
The incident has happened just days before the visit of Pope Francis to Iraq. Pope Francis said Wednesday he still expected to make his historic visit to Iraq in two days' time, despite the many challenges. The day after tomorrow, God willing, I will travel to Iraq for a three days long pilgrimage. I have been waiting for so long to meet those people who have suffered so much, to meet that martyr church in the land of Abraham together with other religious leaders. We will make one more step forward toward the brotherhood of the believers. I ask you to accompany with your prayers this apostolic trip so that it can develop in the best possible way, bringing the fruit that we hope. The Iraqi people are waiting for us. They were waiting for St. John Paul II, but he was prevented from going. We can disappoint these people for the second time. Let's pray that this truth will go well. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said on Wednesday that the new sanctions of the United States and the European Union against citizens and organizations of Russia interfere in the internal affairs of the country. Peskov also said that Moscow considers such decisions as absurd and without grounds. The presidency's press secretary stated that such restrictions are unacceptable because they significantly damage the already deplorable relations with both the EU and the United States. The spokesperson urged the US and the EU to present the evidence they claim to have on the alleged poisoning of Alexei Navalny. A strong 6.3 magnitude earthquake hit central Greece on Wednesday, the U.S. Geological Survey said, prompting residents in the city of Larissa to rush into the streets, according to local media. The Institute of Geodynamics in Athens said the quake, which was felt across central and northern Greece, had a magnitude of 6. According to the Athens Observatory, the epicenter of the quake was 21 kilometers south of the town of Elasona, near Larissa. There was at least three aftershocks following the main tremor, including one at magnitude 4, and authorities warned there could be more. We'll take a short break now, but we'll be right back, so don't go away. Welcome back. A first batch of 240,000 doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine arrived in Rwandan capital Kigali. A second shipment of almost 103,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine, also from the COVAX mechanism, is expected to arrive later in the day. Uh, the price uh, a dose is uh, 3.3 US dollars for AstraZeneca that uh, we are getting here. And uh, so it's a uh, it's a good amount that we are receiving. As you know, the government of Rwanda is part of COVAX facility. We receive, uh, in coming months, additional doses until we reach 7 million of doses under COVAX doses. The objective is to vaccinate up to 7.8 million Rwandese uh, up to, let's say, June 2022. On Tuesday, Guatemala received 200,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccine as a donation from India, which will be used to complete the immunization of health workers responding to the pandemic that has left nearly 6,500 fatalities in the country. The donation of COVID shield vaccines manufactured by AstraZeneca Laboratory arrive on a plane from Mumbai, India. The immunizer, which requires the injection of two doses between 8 and 12 weeks apart, joins the 2,500 Moderna vaccines given by Israel to the Latin American country last week. On February 25, Guatemala started its campaign by vaccinating health workers with the doses donated by Israel. With the new shipment, the country will also begin immunizing the elderly and people with underlying diseases.
and also speaking during an expert online panel event hosted by the University of Edinburgh and the Edinburgh Future Institute this Tuesday, top U.S. infectious disease expert Anthony Fauci and top Chinese respiratory disease expert Song Nanshan expressed optimism about effective control of the COVID-19 pandemic in the coming year. That one year from now, my hope would be that we will have implemented vaccine programs. I know we're not going to get the world vaccinated in one year, but I would hope that we suppress the dynamics of this outbreak to the point where it may not be eliminated, but it is under extraordinarily good control so that there can be some steps towards normality. What I believe the situation will be happening is quite difficult to predict. But anyway, I, I'm optimistic for the situation, the situation uh, in the one year time, I think that all the situation is getting much better as compared with right now. So uh, uh, that's what I think. So we need to have to more work to do, to have a global collaboration from each other in terms of developing some uh, effective uh, uh, drugs and uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies and also effective uh, vaccines. The governor of the U.S. state of Texas, Greg Abbott, announced the lifting of the face mask mandate, making it the largest state to end an order aimed at preventing the spread of the coronavirus that has killed more than 240,000 Texas. The governor also announced the authorization for all businesses to 100 percent reopened. Today, I'm issuing a new executive order that rescinds most of the earlier executive orders. Effective next Wednesday, all businesses of any type are allowed to open 100 percent. That includes any type of entity in Texas. Also, I am ending the statewide mask mandate. In the United States, access to COVID-19 vaccination is based on money. From Los Angeles, we bring you the following report from Eloy Orasem, correspondent from Brazil de Faro. Although effective against the novel coronavirus, the vaccines distributed in the United States have a side effect, the deepening of social inequality in the health care system. According to Stat News, the distribution of available doses is linked to people's income. In the richest areas of the country, the immunization rate is higher. To understand the dimension of this abyss, we can look at the situation in California, the most populated and richest state in the country. There, people in the richest areas are vaccinated 56% faster than those in the poorest regions. Where we can see that areas that have higher levels of this social vulnerability currently are experiencing higher levels of COVID infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. And so what we want to see in this next phase of the pandemic is could we use those data to target areas that have that higher social vulnerability, have higher levels of COVID. Those are the areas we need to especially focus on for vaccine distribution. Beyond income, the administration of vaccine doses is also a racial issue. According to an Associated Press survey, the African-American, Hispanic, and indigenous population of the United States suffers mortality rates three times higher than that of the white population. Vaccination does not follow this logic, however, and in states such as North Carolina, where white people make up 68 percent of the population, they make up 82 percent of those vaccinated. If we are prioritizing health workers, but we are not worried about the person of color who are having the low paid job within the health worker, he is losing or she is losing the line in the machine. So we need to be mindful of those things. We need to mind, be mindful that people of, of minority may suffer from chronic conditions because of multiple reasons. So we need to reach out to them. We need to have campaign to reach out to them. Although the pandemic has shown the disparity in access to health care, this inequality existed before the arrival of the novel coronavirus, and the only cure is to remedy the problem at its roots. I think it really starts with what people call the social determinants of health, and that's often described as where you're born, live, work, and play. And so from the very moment 
an individual is born, they're born into a set of social circumstances. And so in settings, for example, the US where there's a lot of societal or structural inequities, those paths look very different from how early childhood education or being raised to what opportunities there are to what food access, many things really diverge early on. When I see someone in the hospital, I think they've come in with this condition. Where did that really start? However, in the case of the current pandemic, experts warn that efforts must be global, not focused in a single place. And I wanted to send this message very clear and very loud, that rich countries need to pay attention to poor countries and put money into uh, helping lower income, middle income countries to expedite the, the rollout of the vaccinations. We need globalization in here. Um, Insulation is now the solution. I mean, solving just the problem for country A, high income country, will now solve the situation because trade will still open, movement of people will still open. So at the global level, country has to put money to reduce these disparities. Bloomberg estimates that at the current rate, it will take the up to seven years for the world to be immunized against COVID-19, taking into account that 75% of the world population would need to be vaccinated. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.